And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions. I don't know what got into Paul as he was writing to the Romans. You, I, I know there are times when I start preaching real good and I stuff just starts slipping out of my mouth. I can't explain it. It just comes flying out of my mouth because I'm, I'm just excited about what God is doing. And I wonder if maybe that was what was happening here, that Paul was pinning this letter to the Romans and it got so good to him that, that maybe he made a typo because I don't know too many people who boast in their afflictions. When's the last time you seen somebody leave the doctor's office saying, I got cancer, y'all? Nah, you don't really see that too much. I, I, I don't recall too many phone calls with the IRS where folks hung up and said, ah, they freezing my bank account, y'all. We, we don't boast in our afflictions. But I was watching a stand-up special by a brother named Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart's a very funny guy, and he lives a lot of his comedy, and one of his comedy specials was one entitled Laugh at My Pain. Mm. Laugh at My Laugh Pain. This is a very interesting title um, because it really fits the content of that stand-up special. Now, I know y'all saved. Y'all don't watch stand-up comedians except Sinbad because he don't cuss. But, 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 but every so often, I watch comedians like Kevin Hart and, and some others, and, and this Laugh at My Pain one was very interesting. Uh, because in this particular stand-up special, Kevin began sharing some things about his past. He began to share some things about his childhood. One of those things that he shares in this, this um, stand-up special called Laugh at My Pain is the relationship between himself and his father. His father uh, had a drug addiction. His, his father would do things for drugs that uh, are really embarrassing. He, he would do things while he was on drugs that were very embarrassing. And Kevin is divulging all of this, 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 this pain that he went through as a child, but, but the crowd is laughing because he's presenting it in such a way that he's turned that pain into pleasure for other people. My God, my God. And so as I watched Kevin navigating through this, this, this painful childhood at, at the expense of himself, we're laughing, we're, we're enjoying ourselves. In a way, he's helping us to forget our pain by talking about his pain. I'm wondering how did Kevin get to this place where he could talk about something so hurtful in his life in, in this way, in this way where he could bring joy to other people. And I believe that this is something that Paul began to understand, that Paul understood that things may be painful now. But on the other side of this pain, there's some power. On the other side of this pain, there's some pleasure. I'm reminded of the psalm writer who says, weeping may endure for a night, but, but, but joy comes in the morning. That, that, that There's something on the other side of the pain and the trauma and the turmoil that I'm going through. And, and because of that, because Kevin came out on the other side, we now can laugh at his pain, it's amazing as I watched him sharing these things that were clearly embarrassing to him, clearly uh, hurtful to him. People in the audience were not thinking about Kevin. They were laughing at him. In fact, some of them laughed themselves to tears at his pain. If I would give today's sermon a title, it would be Laugh at My Pain. And I, I don't believe that Paul is telling us to get to a place where we laugh at our pain, but I believe he's asking us to get to a place where we can applaud even in affliction. Yes. Come on. Yes. Now, I know it's, that's, that's not something you wanna shout over. You wanna shout when I say that God is gonna send you that brand new car because you have not been acting up. I know you wanna shout because uh, uh, I just prophesied to you that you're gonna find your boo on aisle two at Food Line. I know you wanna shout uh, 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 because I say there's unclaimed money and checks coming in the mail, uh, uh, that you're going to get houses that you did not build, vineyards that you did not build. We love to run around and roll on the floor and high five our neighbor. But what if I told you that the word of the Lord is that you're about to go through a season of affliction? How many of you could lift up holy hands and say, God, whatever it is, I can still brag. I can still boast because I don't care what comes against me. The one that is in me is greater than that which is against if God be for me, he's greater than that which is against me. I didn't expect to get too many amens because we don't like affliction. We don't 
like pain. If we could run away from pain, we would run away from pain. If, if I never had to experience another heartbreak, that would be fine by me. If folks never walked out of my life again, that would be fine. I wish I could tell you that your life would be happily ever after, but before the happily ever after, there's a once upon a time. And Paul says, Paul says, um, I know this is going to sound strange, Roman church, but we don't just shout to the glory of God. We shout in our affliction. So my question to Paul is, Paul, how do you get to a place where you can applaud in affliction? How, how do I get to a place where I'm no longer bragging about how much money I have in the bank, but I'm bragging about how long God has sustained me with zero dollars. Yes. How, how do I get to a place where I'm not bragging about the Beamer, Bentley, or Benz, but, but, but I'm bragging about the fact that I don't own a car, but I stay riding? Yes. How do I get to that place, Paul? And, and I believe Paul gives us a, a good prescription in this text. Did y'all come to take notes this morning? Yes, I, I believe he gives us a good prescription we a strategic church. We move in strategy in Jesus' name. I, I believe I'm going to give you some strategy this morning uh, uh, that helps you get to a place uh, and a perspective of how to deal with your affliction so that you don't have to wait till the end of the sermon and I tell you Jesus got up uh, or that your boo is coming or that money is coming or that we just expanded our campus. No, no, no. You can shout in the midst of the weeping season. You can shout in the midst of the heavy season. You can shout in in the midst of the hurting season. Uh, uh, Paul, how do we get to this perspective? Paul begins this part of the letter by talking about faith. Somebody say faith. Faith. It's amazing to me that we are people who supposedly walk by faith and not by sight, but most of us don't really live that thing. Yes, we we, we yes, talk yes, yes. about faith, and faith sounds good, yes, you know? It, yes. Faith sounds amazing, but, 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 but practicing faith is a little different. Yes, sir. I, I, I come from a time where uh, there's an old saying, you practice what you preach. And yeah. I hate to say it, but many of us preach faith, but we don't really practice yeah. faith. I, listen, I got to see it before I see it. We yeah. those type of people. You, you got to show me what the number looks like yeah. before. I, you got to show me the next couple of steps before I take the first step. But but, but Paul said, no, 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 no. If, if you're going to get to this place where you can applaud in affliction, you, you got to walk by faith. Uh, the text says, therefore... Since we have been justified, somebody say justified. justified. Now, last week I told you that word justified is cool, but it's real churchy. And so I like the translation that says approved. Therefore, since we've been approved, and the reason I like that word approved is because some of us have been rejected so long that justified really don't do nothing for us. And so he says, listen, therefore, since we have been approved by faith, we have peace with God. Since we've been approved by faith. Faith, we have peace with God. I'm going to say it one more time. We've been approved by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So faith gives us an approval. Faith gives us an approval. That's my first point. Faith gives us an approval. Somebody say, I've been approved. Now, now, what does that actually mean? Paul is saying something very profound here, and I think you missed it. It just shot right over your head. So I'm going to read it one more time, and I'm going to break it down like a shotgun, as Bishop would say. Therefore, since we have been approved by faith, we have peace with God. But this peace with God came at the expense of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, I've, I've received God's approval by my faith. My God. Now, uh, 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 most of us have been rejected because of our faults. Mm -hmm. But God says, I've approved you by your faith. Wow. I'm going to say that again. Awesome. Most of us have been rejected by our faults. Yes, but God says, I'm so glad God is not man. Uh, God says, I will approve you by your faith. The world has rejected you because of your faults. But I'm going to approve you by your faith. I'm going to bring you. And as a result of this approval, and this is part that's going to mess us up, especially the religious folks, yes. he says we have peace with God. Uh -huh. My God. My God. Ah. Work on me. The reason y'all can't shout about yes. peace with God is because you've never been at war with God. Mm. 
Ah, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, because you've been approved by faith, you have peace with God. So watch this. God is no longer at war with me. Now, the reason that's good news is because God is still at war with something, but he's not at war with me. Uh, I'm so glad that God is at war with everything that is at war with me. This is why we can declare the battle is not mine. It's the Lord's God. Because I've been approved by my faith. And because I've been approved by my faith, I have peace with God. Uh, I'm so glad God, and I used to think this way, that God is not sitting on a cloud waiting on me to mess up so he can strike me down. And it's sad to say that there are churches filled with people who say they walk by faith, that they've been justified, uh, but they feel like God is watching them and waiting for them. Can I help somebody this morning? God ain't stunting your mess up because though a righteous man falls several times, he gets up every time. But the question is, how do I get up every time? Because I'm not getting up on my own. God is in me. God is not at war with me. God is at war with that which made me fall. And so if I can receive that, and understand that I'm not fighting, I'm just gliding. I'm at peace with God, and since I'm at peace with God, I'm not at war with anything. God is at war for me. And if God is fighting that which is making me fall, then if I'm trusting the battle in his hands, then I ain't worried about nothing. He says, we have been approved by faith. And so, since the world rejects me by my faults, and this is why the gospel message should, should, should be so uh, 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 enticing to the world, because all of us have gone through some form of rejection. Some of us, I hate to say it, but your parent rejected you. You came into the world with only one parent because one parent did not want you. Old Psalm said it this way, Papa was a rolling stone wherever he laid his hat was his home and, and, and when he died, all he left us was alone. <laughs> What's funny, before I knew better, I actually, I, I didn't realize they were saying alone, A-L-O-N-E. I thought they were saying A-L-O-A-N. And I was like, that's a bad man. He left him and put some dead on him. That's a deadbeat dad right there. Yeah, like, listen, I'm gone. Y'all gonna receive some mail in a few weeks. I took a loan out so I could move. Y'all do it. I'll holler at y'all. It's a bad man. But no, you're saying he left us alone. All he left us was alone. He left us by ourselves. Come back, I'm preaching. <laughs> he left us by ourselves. Y'all y'all make me laugh. I'm on camera now. Um, uh, all he left was alone. Uh, uh, we've been rejected by our faults, but God says, no, no, no. I'm going to approve you by faith. And the good news about that is I did not work for God's approval. I want to ask you this morning, what's your motivation? What's your motivation? Why do you come to church Sunday after Sunday? Why uh, uh, do you abstain from certain things? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why do we do the things we do? And sad to say for many of us, we do religious things because we're looking for approval. And the problem with that is, and, and, and it's sad to say that we've been conditioned this way because the world says prove Prove, prove, yes. prove, yes. Uh, prove we should like you, prove we should follow you, prove we should embrace you, prove we should look to you, prove you got, the, and we live in a show and prove world, but I'm so glad that God does not ask us to prove. In fact, the Bible says it's the opposite with God. He doesn't ask us to prove we should be loved. He proves to us we should be loved. Ah, he does not make us prove we should be saved. He to us that we should be saved. This ain't even a part of my notes. I'm so glad that God does not operate like the world operates. That, that, that I don't come to church Sunday after Sunday to prove anything to God. It's sad to say some of you have been in bondage. You've really been coming to church to prove to the saints that you're holy because you know they talk about you when you don't come, which means they're actually the God you're bowing to instead of the God of heaven. Because God don't care if you roll over in uh, bedside Baptist on Sunday morning. Maybe you had a long week. Can I just be honest? I'm a liberal pastor. Listen, as long as you tuning in and getting the word in you, I don't care if you bring your butt to the seat. Now, listen, at least come see me from time to time so I can know you're breathing. Uh, but it, it's not my job to police your salvation. If I'm sending the word, whether I see it working or not, it's working. Because his word does not return until him void. 
but it accomplishes that which he sends it forth to do. So whether I see your life changing or not, I know what I'm preaching. And as long as I know what I'm preaching, I know the word. Somebody say the word works. The word works. The word works. So what are you trying to prove? He said, no, 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 no. Um, um, you have my approval. Somebody say, I have his approval. I have his approval. In other words, you've already won. It's, it's, it's like back in the day, we used to have arcade games, and uh, you would go to the arcade, and you could tell the people who really ain't have a life, because their name would be all the way at the top. They would have what they call the high score. These are people who clearly have no other hobbies. They don't have friends. All they do, don't judge my brother, all they do is sit and play on an arcade game all day. That's how they got the high score. It would be crazy for them to get the high score, and to continue to come back and come back. And why are you doing that? You already one. You, you, you beat it. And you can't get no, in fact, you broke the game and we can't even play it no more. Uh, but we do this with our salvation. We already have approval, but we go through our lives still trying to prove God, this is why you should love me. This is why you died for me. No, 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 no. Paul says my righteousness is as a filthy rag. And so he really shouldn't have died for me, but I'm so glad that he did. I can't think of enough reasons why God loves me, but he does. And so I'm not trying to prove something to him because he's already proved something to me. And because of that, I have peace with him. I have peace with God. He says faith gives us an approval. We ain't got nothing to prove. And in fact, we have peace with God. And since you got peace with God, that means he's at war with anything at war with you. This is why I don't care what you got to say about Pastor Mike, because my battle ain't with you. Your battle is with him. Because if God called me, listen, all I got to do is walk in it. And some of you, I don't know why I needed to remind you of that this morning, but there's some folks that are trying to make you feel unqualified for what God has qualified you for. And listen, you, you keep trying to to defend it. Well, I've been to this school and I got this many years of experience. No, no, no. The devil is a lie. That ain't yours to defend. Listen, you got a problem with what God called me to be? Talk it up with God because I'm too busy walking in my purpose. Many of us, can I go back to Bible study real quick? The reason many of us are struggling to walk in our purpose is because we're wasting too much energy trying to defend the purpose that God gave us. I don't care if you understand my purpose or not. It ain't for you to understand my purpose. I don't even fully understand my purpose. And so both of us ain't going to sit here go around in circles. You wrestle with that. I'm going to walk in my purpose. You're welcome. Uh, faith gives us approval. I'm trying to get to the meat of the message. But faith also gives us access. So faith gives us approval and faith gives us access. Paul goes on to say we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. He says, we've obtained access. Somebody say access. 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 That word access is a beautiful word. In other words, to gain access to a thing means I have gained entry into that thing. In other words, he says, there is a door that has been opened for you. Now, the question is, where is this door leading me to? And he says, this door that has been opened to you by faith. In other words, my faith is what opened the door. My education did not open the door. Uh, my connections did not open the door. My friendships did not open the door. No, no, no. What opened this door was faith. Can I help somebody? Some of you are closing your own doors because you're trying to see something. And God is saying, no, no, no. I'm reminded of, uh, uh, was it Space Jam? It might have been the new Space Jam. Y'all pray for LeBron. I don't know what that was. But uh, nevertheless, uh, 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 it... On, on Looney Tunes, they would paint a door on a place there was no door. Right. And what would be interesting is the person who painted the door would go through the door, but then the person chasing the one who painted the door would smack whatever it was he painted on. That's how it is to be a believer. Yeah. I, go. I, go. I walk through doors you can't see and that you can't walk through. Can I help somebody? The reason some folks are mad at you is because they saw you walk in a place they could not walk in, that they tried to pay their way into that place and their money won't long enough, that they tried to handshake their way into it but they friendless won't long enough, and they're trying to wrap their mind around how did you walk through a place there was no door, and how come I can't get another? It won't for you. I walk by faith, not by sight. My faith opened the door. I used to scratch my head and be like, God, how in the world did I end up here? And he would smack me in the back of my head and say, it was your faith. 
I, I, you, you know what your resume looked like. It was your faith. Yeah, you, you, you know you an introvert. You ain't got that many friends. It was your faith. Yeah, 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 you know what you got in the bank. It was your faith. And eventually I just got the message. God bless you, my brother. Eventually I just got the message. And, and there's a confidence I now walk in. To quote the uh, late, great Michael Green, one of my mentors, he said, no matter where you go, go in there as though you belong. Yes. And I've never been the same because my credentials may say I don't belong, but my God says I belong. And listen, I may not be your favorite, but I'm God's child. And that's all that matters. I know you say I don't belong here, uh, but my faith says I do. I believe too hard to get at this table. I, I believe too hard to start this business. I believe too hard to lead. I believe too hard for this thing. And so uh, my faith gave me access into this place. But what is this place? What, what is this place that my faith has opened the door to? He said this place that we've obtained access to by our faith is into this grace. Somebody say grace is a place. Grace is a place. So why are you trying to possess a place? I'm going to say that again. I think you missed it. Why are you trying to possess a place? Okay, one more time. Why are you trying to possess a place? He says you've, get, you've gotten access into this place called grace. Watch this. He says in which we stand. So watch this. I'm not holding grace. I'm standing on grace. You want to know why the enemy keeps trying to make you move? Because you're standing in grace. Uh, there's this game called um, Twister. It's a game called Twister. And, and on the game Twister, you, you spin the little thing, uh, uh, and whatever color it lands on, you have to position a part of yourself on that color. And the key is to remain on whatever color that you're supposed to be on. And the moment you move out of the place that you're supposed to be in, uh, you lose the game. You are out. Uh, this is why, thank you, Holy Spirit. This is why the enemy is trying to twist and turn you up. Because he knows if he can get your foot off of that place called grace. Okay, it ain't making sense yet. Let me tell you what grace means. Uh, grace is unmerited favor. Okay, so watch this. I'm not trying to obtain God's favor. I'm standing in God's favor. And the reason the enemy keeps trying to move you is because if he can move you out of God's favor, he can move you into his failures. Ah, uh, this is why the enemy is pushing up against you. This is why he's trying to twist and turn you. Because if he can just get you to move your foot out of this place, somebody say grace is a place. Grace is a place. If he can get you to move out of that place. But am I talking to a church who will be steadfast and unmovable in this season? Because watch this. In Twister, you don't move until another color is called. And maybe some of us have moved out of God's favor because we moved before he called. Hold on. He says, I've given you approval, so you don't have nothing to prove. In fact, I prove to you, uh, uh, you have access, and you have access not to this thing, but you have access to this place. And, and if you would just stand in this favor, ah, I, I wish somebody would just get that in their spirit, that I'm standing in favor. I, I, I'm standing in favor. I'm, I'm, I'm standing in favor. I'm not trying to get to favor. I'm standing in favor. He says, uh, 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 uh. You, you, you've been uh, through faith into his grace in which we stand. And then he says, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, he sets a precedence. He gives us a praise break right here. He says, listen, I know the first part was good news and this part was good news, but I'm giving you some better news. Watch this. He says, uh, uh, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, this is why you get into the Greek and the Hebrew, because to read that on the surface, I started to think about the kabod, the, the glory, the heaviness of God, but that's not exactly what he's talking about here. If you go into the Greek, and, and this is why you ensure your pastor has great study materials, what it's actually saying uh, is this glory that's described is not attributed to God. I'm gonna mess you up. The glory is attributed to you. Ah, I know some of y'all like Pastor Mike. You blaspheming, bro. What you mean? Ain't no glory on me. To God be all the glory. That's what Bishop told me. Now, don't give me no glory to God. No, 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 no. If you go to the original language, it's a glory that's attributed to you. Can I read the exact word study definition of this word glory? Again, it's not the kabod. It's not the heaviness of the presence of God. Watch this. It's the glorious condition of blessedness 
into which it is appointed and promised that true Christians shall enter after their Savior's return from heaven. In other words, it does not yet appear what we'll be like. Yeah, uh, uh, he says we have hope because there's a glory you ain't touched yet. There's a glory that you're not going to hit until Jesus comes back. And so the reason I have hope, watch this, is because I won't always be like this. I know I ain't shining right now, but there is a shine that's coming that you ain't... Your stunner shades ain't going to be able to block the glory that God releases on me. There is a condition of blessedness. Somebody say blessedness. blessedness. Matter of fact, put that as your status on Facebook. I am in a condition of blessedness. There is a condition of blessedness that we have expectation for. The reason I woke up with expectation is because no matter how much pain I'm in, I won't always be like this. The reason I woke up excited is because no matter what's going on, it won't always be like this. He says, we boast in the hope, but the hope is not in people. The hope is not in things. The hope is not in places, but the hope is in a future that's to come. Somebody say, my future is better. My future is better. So I ain't tripping over my present. There is a glory that God is going to release on us. When he comes back, we get a, uh, an example of it when Moses comes down from the mountaintop after speaking to God. The Bible says that there was such a glow on Moses that he literally had to put something over his face because he was blinding the people. There's a glory that's yet to come. So he says, this is why we shout. We, we, we shout over that. But now we got to wrestle with affliction. I know, y'all, you go ahead and turn your cameras off. I know you don't want to hear this, but hey, uh, faith gives us, let's, let's recap, faith gives us approval, faith gives us access, but then faith gives us perspective during affliction. I know it hurt every time I say it, don't it? Faith gives us perspective during affliction. Now Paul is going to begin to give us, uh, uh, I believe, the Kevin Hart methodology uh, of how we can laugh at our pain, how we can applaud at our affliction. Uh, uh, faith gives us perspective during affliction. Now the question you should be asking yourself is how does faith, uh, how does, uh, uh, faith give us perspective during affliction? Well, uh, he gives us a prescription here. There's three things that he lines out for us. The first one, uh, affliction helps us endure. Affliction helps us endure. So again, we're, ch we're shifting our perspective on affliction. The problem many of us have is that we think affliction is coming to take us out. No, 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 no. Paul says affliction helps us to endure. What do I mean? Verse 3, he says, and not only that, he said, I'm about to kill you shout, unfortunately. We also boast in our afflictions. So we boast in the glory of God, not not God's glory, but there's a glory that God is going to share with us at an appointed time. We we shout about that. We don't see it yet, but we know it's coming. And so we have this expectation about it, that, that there is a condition of I'm putting that on my Facebook. I am in a condition of blessedness. There is a condition of blessedness that God is going to give to us. So I have expectation. But he says not only that, but we also boast in our affliction. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Let's deal with boast a little bit. Uh, he says, not only that, but we boast. Somebody say boast. boast. So again, I'm not trying to flex on y'all, but I went to the Greek. And when I went to the Greek, that word boast actually comes from a root word, which means neck. And when you look at it in its direct translation, what he's actually saying is, uh, 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 my head is up high. So he says, I approach affliction yes. with my head up high. Y'all ain't caught it yet. Uh, some of y'all still looking down. No. Uh, uh, I approach affliction with my head held high. Thank you. Don't ever let me see you walk through 82 Afton Parkway with your head down. Because we approach affliction with our head held high. Yeah, yeah. He's literally conditioning us to show us this is how kingdom people operate. Yes. See, the world says you should be ashamed. Uh -huh. No, no, no. God says keep your head held high. Uh, uh, he says we boast in our afflictions. Now, now, what is this thing affliction? Again, I had to go to the Greek, and what I discovered is that this thing affliction uh, is the word flipsis. It's flips, uh, that flipsis, tongue twister, and it means pressure. 
And it's what constricts or rubs together. It's what constricts or rubs together. And I don't know if you've ever been in a tight situation uh, 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 where it literally felt like life was choking the life out of you. Uh, he says, listen, when life starts to try to choke you out, thank you, Holy Spirit, I quote the revelation. Uh, when life begins to choke you out, watch this. Don't look down and suffocate. Look up and get, uh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I will look unto the hills from which cometh my help, all my help, but I just got to move my neck. I know life has its hands on your neck, but if you can lift your neck up high, then you can get more air in. One of the things they used to tell us back in PE, when we would do our, um, we would run the, the mile every year, uh, we would get really tired. And what they would tell us is, when you get tired, when you're running, you don't do this because you're, you're restricting air from getting in. They say you do this so that you can get more air in. And this is why I don't know why y'all come in on Sunday and your arms are like this. Mm -mm -mm. No, 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 life is choking me. I'm gonna lift my hands up because I need something. I need the Ruah, the breath of God, which is the Holy Spirit. So I lift up my hands to tell the Holy Spirit, you can land right here. I need the Ruah. I need the wind, the breath of God because life is choking me out. And it's rubbing me the wrong way. He says we keep our head high when life brings its pressure in that tries to choke us and rub us the wrong way. And then when we do that, he says it produces endurance. So he says you want to look at affliction as an opportunity, not an obstacle, because affliction is going to actually make you better because you're going to endure. Now, that don't mean nothing to you because you don't know that what that word endure means. So I went to the Greek again. I did. I went to the Greek again. I promise I ain't trying to flex on y'all. But 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 the, but the Greek word that is translated from actually means to remain under. To remain under. My God, can we put this together? So he says, when affliction comes, uh -huh. uh, 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 keep your head up high, even when it's choking you out, because you're gonna learn how to remain under for a long time. Uh -huh. Don't miss the key word there. I'm gonna be under. But I'm going to learn how to remain. I'm going to be under, but I'm going to learn how to remain. I'm going to be under, but it ain't going to kill me. I'm going to be under, but it's only going to be for a season. I'm going to be under, but I'm getting back over. I'm going to be under, I'm going to learn how to remain. Okay, let's see if I can make sense of this for you. Um, how many of you know what this is? It's a rubber band. It's a rubber band. Right. It's right. started by a T.I. song, Rubber Band Man. But it's a rubber band. I ain't been saved my whole life. Don't judge me. Uh, a rubber band is interesting. A rubber band is interesting because a rubber band works based on tension. Yeah, to, 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 to make a rubber band work, you have to apply pressure. There has to be some tension. And what's interesting about a rubber band, can I revelate? What's interesting about a rubber band is that the more tension you give the rubber band, if the rubber band can withstand the tension, I'm about to help somebody. When the tension is finally released, it goes far. My God. Okay. Here's where y'all mess up. Y'all are trying to overcome affliction. No, no, no. All you got to do is outlast affliction. Why? Because many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God delivers us. But God delivers us. But God delivers us. Out of them all. Uh, uh, it's not my job to overcome affliction. And maybe the reason some of y'all are so tired is because you're trying to overcome what God is just saying outlast. In other words, all I need you to do is outlive that thing. Because watch this. The moment the pressure releases, I'm going to launch you further into your purpose than you've ever been. Yes. I don't have to overcome affliction. I just have to outlast affliction. Why? Because many are the afflictions of the righteous, but not myself. God 
will deliver me out of them all. And so what I'm doing is I'm waiting. But while I'm waiting, I'm worshiping. While I'm waiting, I'm warring through my uh, uh, through my worship. I'm not warring against the pressure. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm literally reminding my pressure that my God still reigns. That my God is still good. That my God is coming through. I know you feel like you got your foot on my neck right now. Oh, but when daddy come. Oh, when daddy come. Oh, when daddy come. When he releases the pressure because he got to do it. And see, here's what I love about that delivery. I'm so glad he chose that word. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers. Somebody say delivers. Watch this. Every delivery has an estimated time of arrival. So if God is going to deliver, it's not a matter of if, it's when. Nah. So I don't have to overcome it. I just got to outlast it. You know what, Daddy? You ain't send me no tracking info, but I know you're coming. So I'm going to keep worshiping in spite of it. I'm going to keep praising in spite of it. I'm going to keep testifying in spite of it. Oh, because when you deliver, oh, when you deliver, oh, when you deliver, I'm going further than I've ever been. Thank you, Jesus. So watch this. So watch this. So pressure. I'm not contending with pressure. But pressure is literally setting me up for my next place. See, if we understood affliction from that perspective, affliction is not setting me back. It's pulling me back. Affliction ain't setting me back. It's pulling me back. Because it's literally a catalyst into the next place. And here's the thing. The, the, the more I remain under that pressure and it catapults me to my next place, it now has prepared me because watch this, I've been stretched. <laughs> so now I can handle more pressure when I get to the next place. Uh, uh, affliction helps us endure. Somebody say endure. Endure. Now, after affliction helps us to endure, again, he's given us a prescription, uh, endurance helps us to mature. Mm -hmm. We rhyme in today. It, it, it helps us to endure, and then it helps us to mature. Now, we don't like that word maturity. Uh, uh, we like growth, but we don't like maturity, and there's a difference. We like growth because growth is numeric. Growth, growth you can see that thing, but 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 maturity is oftentimes invisible. You you, you don't see my maturity. You, you might hear my maturity. You don't see my maturity. Uh, it's just this thing that begins to manifest where you see me like this one day, and then I'm a whole nother way the next way. Maturity is a little different. You can't measure my maturity. It's, it's this invisible thing. But Paul says endurance produces proven character. So maturity is my character proven. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. He says, after I've endured, it's going to prove who's really in me. And this is the mindset we have to have with affliction. Okay, God, I don't know why you're leading me to this affliction, but there must be a better me on the other side. Uh, uh, it, you're going to prove what's really in me. You know what affliction does? It proves if you really forgave them or not. <laughs> you know what affliction does? It proves where your faith really is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what affliction does? It proves where your heart really is. He says endurance is going to prove your character. How does affliction prove my character? Well, uh, uh, after I've endured, after I've gone through the pressure, uh, uh, pressure has a way of removing things. And so what comes out of the other side of the pressure is something more beautiful than what went in. In other words, we can use fire, for example. If you put gold into fire, it begins to change the substance of it. See, gold, believe it or not, is this very ugly substance until you put it into some fire. And once you put it into some fire, it begins to burn off the impurities. And when it burns off the impurities, everything that made it ugly has now been stripped. And what you're left with is what the gold should have always been. I'm helping somebody. What you're left with is what was always in there. Nothing was added to the gold. It was brought out of the gold. The reason I need affliction is because there's something in me that you don't see right now. Ah, and I love God that he don't have to add nothing to it. All he got to do is burn them negative folks off. All he got to do is burn them negative habits off. All he got to do is burn those old things off. All he has to do is burn, burn those negative thoughts off. Because when we come through the fire, 
and were tried in the fire, the Bible said it come out as pure gold. Nothing's added to the gold. What was always in the gold has just come out because I burned off everything that didn't belong. So watch this. We really should be thanking God for affliction because it burns off what we wouldn't let go. God, some of you are trying to figure out how to dump some people right now. And God is saying, just give it another season. Some affliction's coming. Because watch this. Everything can't live in the pressure. Ah. Everything can't live in the pressure. Everything can't withstand the fire that God is putting you through. And the fire is not to consume you. The fire is to pull out of you what always has been in you. So I'm coming out as what I should have always been. He says you can applaud affliction because affliction brings with it endurance. You, you, you're going to get the ability to remain under longer. Your affliction is not uh, uh, setting you back. It's pulling you back because it's a catapult. It's not what you're contending with. It's a catapult. It's really here to just shoot you to the next place because if we can be honest, some of us take too long. Sometimes God sends affliction because we like wandering in the wilderness. I don't know what it is about dry places, but we just love hanging around dry places too long. And God says, you know what? I'm going to send some affliction because if you ain't going to walk into your destiny, I'm going to shoot you into your destiny. He sends affliction so that we can endure but after we endure, we mature. And again, we mature, it proves what's always been in us. It brings to the surface everything that was bad for us and leaves everything that's good about us. And after endurance helps us to mature, maturity helps us to be sure. Yeah, so it helps us to endure, it helps us to mature, and then it helps us to be sure. He says, and proving character produces hope. Now, this word hope, I went to the Greek, and uh, this word hope is an expectation of what is sure. So when he says, uh, my maturity gives me hope, what he says is, there is some certainty when I mature. Okay, uh, Paul said it this way, uh, when I was a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I, I put away childish things. Uh, uh, because being a child will keep you out of your purpose. It will keep you out of your destiny. Being a child, you want to play too much. And you can't play when it's time for purpose. And so maturity helps us to be sure. Again, he uses the word hope, or we translated hope. But he says it gives you an expectation. So now that I've matured, my expectation is on things that are certain, yeah. not uncertain. Yes. Because child, uh, children place their faith in temporary things. Wow. And the difference between a child of God and a child who's not a believer is they place their faith in systems that fail. Mm -hmm. They place their faith in people that fail. They place their faith in money that fails. They place their faith in things that aren't certain. But, but he says, no, no, no. Once you've been tried, your expectation changes because now the things that were distracting you have died. So now you can focus on the right things. And so you wake up in the morning with an expectation that everything's going to be okay. Well, how do I know that everything's going to be okay? Because my hope is in what's consistent. Well, what's consistent? Well, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In fact, in Revelation, it calls him the one who was and is and is to come. I've stopped placing my faith and confidence in things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Tomorrow, and I place my faith in God. I know it's going to be okay today because God still reigns. I know I'm going to come out of this situation because God is still God. I know I'm going to come through the diagnosis because God is still a healer. I know that we're going to make it out of this thing because God is still a provider. I know I'm not going to lose my mind because he keeps them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. I know I'm going to make it because God still is God. My expectation has shifted. And I'm sure the world may not be sure, but we're sure. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I, I have a blessed assurance. Even though the world is falling, like, falling down around me, I can be sure because my God is consistent. Yes. And he ends it. He ends it in verse 5. He says, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love 
has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. He says there's a lot of things you've placed your hope in that have disappointed you. You've put your hope in people that have left you hanging. You've put your hope in a career that shipped your job overseas or replaced you or you trained the person that replaced you. You've placed your hope in the, in the banking system and then 2008 came and all that crashed. You placed your faith in friends that you thought would always be around and they moved on to other friends. You placed your faith in a relationship where you said, I do till death and ain't neither one of y'all died, but he moved on. You placed your faith in all these things and it left you disappointed. But Paul says there's one place you can place your hope. And he says it will not. Somebody say it will not. It will not. It will not disappoint you. Paul, why won't it disappoint us? He says, well, I'll tell you. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Let's, let's examine this. Um, the Bible says God is love. So if God's love has been poured out into our hearts and God is love, then God poured himself out into our hearts. In other words, I'm so full of him, I don't have room for nothing else. And this is why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason you can't sleep at night is because you're so full of other stuff. The reason you don't know whether you're coming or going is because you're so full of other stuff. No, no, no. He says, listen, the reason you are hopeless right now is because you're full of stuff that you can't depend on. But if you would fill yourself with the one thing, the one person that will never let you down, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. If you would just fill yourself with him, you're in turn filling yourself with hope because his love has been poured out via the Holy Spirit. And here's the good news. He did it free. He didn't pour himself into me because I was the most valuable person. He did not pour himself into me because I had the most money. He did not pour himself into me because I was always the nicest. He did not pour himself into me because I got perfect attendance at church. No, 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 no. He poured himself into the whosoever's. And the good news is, you're a whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The reason not too many things disappoint me nowadays is because I'm so full of him. Nonsense doesn't stand a chance. Yes. You, you know the reason I can loan you a large sum of money and not cuss you out the next time I see you because you ain't paying me my money back and I seen you blowing money on Facebook? Yes. It's because I'm so full of him. Yes. I, 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 that there's no space for that here. Yes. Yeah, you, you know the reason I don't trip when they start talking about layoffs at the job? I'm so full of him so full. that there's no space for fear. In, in fact, uh, 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 the Bible says he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, yeah. love, yes. and sound mind. And so why would I fill myself with something he didn't pour out? But why would I take on something that's going to put me in the opposite mind frame that I need to be in? He says this hope will not disappoint us. What is your hope in? And we have to get to a place like the seasoned saints. When they say my hope is built on nothing less. <laughs> uh, it, there's a storm out on the ocean. And it's moving this old way. If your soul's not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. The, the reason life's winds can't blow me around is because I'm full of an anchor. I'm full of an anchor that cannot be moved. I'm full of the chief cornerstone. He says it will not disappoint. 